Sup, everybody, this is Theoretical Bullshit. Uh, I was going to do a follow-up video to my treatise on morality, and it was supposed to be like an all-encompassing, comprehensive response to any controversy, any objections, any questions, and, and it dawned on me fairly quickly that that's not realistic. I, I knew going in that I wasn't going to be able to cover everything, and I knew going in that I was going to incur lots and lots of questions, uh, but... But I think I sort of have to take this one step at a time. I can't uh, just do a one-size-fits-all response. So Epidemic 2020 ma made a video response which focused mostly on defending my objections to a Christian philosophy of morality. Uh, and so that's what this is going to be about. And hopefully in the future I'll have a chance to... to address the other stuff. Now, in defending my criticism of, of Christian philosophy and morality, I was going to just collect a bunch of little sound bites from the comments section, little things that I know Christians have or would say, uh, and, and make a sort of compilation video. But, but I got so many, and, and I hope you take this as a compliment, I got so many private messages and comments from Christians requesting that I respond to this particular video. Uh, so... Epidemic, it seems you've, you've been designated the star quarterback of, of Christian morality. Uh, so, QB, let's see how far you can throw the ball. Morality is about two things. It's about what goals and values you should have and how to best achieve those goals. Uh, well, no. No, that's, that's just what a Christian model of morality is about. And I'm not a Christian. That's not what morality is about for me. Because... I reject not only the notion that there exist objective, unconditional obligations to value certain things and not others, but I also reject the notion that such unconditional, objective obligations need to exist in order to have a sound, comprehensive moral philosophy. And I spent a great deal of time defending this in my video. I also argued that even if Christianity were true, it does not and cannot follow that such objective, unconditional obligations exist. Not only that, but a world in which such objective, unconditional obligations exist would be indistinguishable from a world in which they didn't exist, rendering their purported existence altogether trivial and meaningless. And you don't seem to have addressed any of this. But let's see what you did have to say. Human life is valuable. And since human life is valuable, you shouldn't go around raping and killing people. Well, I certainly agree that if you value human life, you shouldn't go around raping and killing people. But what bothers me here is this blanket assertion, human life is valuable. Valuable to whom? To humans, most of the time. To other mammals, hardly. To plants, not at all. I mean, there's no such thing as value independent of a valuer. Being valued is what makes something valuable, just as garnering interest is what makes something interesting. It's not the other way around. That's backwards thinking. Now, it can definitely be said that if we hold certain values, we objectively ought to hold other values. If we value a healthy, happy, cooperative, flourishing society, and we do, it's objectively true that we ought to value human life because to devalue human life is objectively deleterious to a healthy, happy, cooperative, flourishing society. Now, as humans, we recognize that some objective values exist. We're literally hardwired that way. No, we don't. And no, we're not. I mean, ask yourself if Hitler recognized any objective value for human life. I mean, he certainly claimed to recognize objective value for Aryan life and flatly denied any objective value for non-Aryan life. Now to say that Hitler somehow suppressed his hardwired recognition of the value of all human life renders the entire notion unfalsifiable and ultimately trivial. Being completely unaware that you recognize something is the same thing as not recognizing something. The term objective value, i.e. values that exist independently of subjects, is a self-contradictory term. Value is contingent upon subjects. Subjects create and assign value to objects. Without subjects, objects have no value. This means value is necessarily subjective, always. To say that human life has value because God created it or because God assigned value to it doesn't change anything. I mean, God can create anything his timeless, spaceless heart desires, but it won't have value unless God values it, or some other subject values it. And yes, by the way, God would be on the subject side of the subject-object relationship. God is the subject, and what is being valued is the object. So God creating something or assigning value to something doesn't get you to objective value. Even God values things subjectively. Now, in the absence of subjects, a world in which objective values exists is indistinguishable from a world in which they don't exist. 
This is why the idea of objective morality is trivial and meaningless, and incoherent. Now to be clear, denying the existence of objective value is not the same thing as denying that certain actions are objectively right or objectively wrong, given a specific definition of right and wrong. If what we mean by wrong is something that unnecessarily causes harm or suffering, then it's objectively wrong to keep slaves, because keeping slaves objectively causes unnecessary harm and suffering. But that's different from saying that suffering itself is objectively less valuable than well-being, as if this were true irrespective of the way subjective beings experience well-being and suffering. That's what I don't buy. Now your only attempt to demonstrate that objective values exist was to say that I already recognize this fact by citing something I say in my video. I'm just going to point out a piece of your video that actually shows that you already recognize this fact. It is objectively true that something like rape causes unnecessary suffering. Now if you mean it when you say that it is objectively true that rape causes unnecessary suffering, then a rapist should not rape people even if they subjectively value their personal pleasure over the victim's well-being. No, that doesn't follow at all. It is objectively true that rape causes unnecessary suffering. But if a rapist places a higher value on the pleasure they get from raping someone than the value they place on that person's well-being, it follows for them that they ought to rape people. This is true whether a god exists or not. The problem is, most rapists wouldn't actually claim to hold this value. They just have an overwhelming drive to cause unnecessary suffering anyway. That human beings do things contrary to their values is a phenomenon we owe it to ourselves to investigate, but this doesn't speak to the values we hold in the first place. But there's a deeper issue here. Do rapists, like the rest of us, desire a happy, healthy, cooperative, flourishing society? Do they desire to maintain relationships from which they will benefit? Do they desire to be treated fairly, respectfully, and compassionately by others? Do they desire to like themselves as a result of being the kind of person that they enjoy? If they do, then it is objectively true that they ought not place more value on their own pleasure than the well-being of others, since doing so is deleterious to the actualization of any of these circumstances. If they don't desire a healthy, happy, cooperative, flourishing society, and so on, then it's perfectly consistent for them to value their own pleasure over the well-being of others. Now this doesn't change the fact that doing so is morally wrong, insofar as what we mean by morally wrong is that which causes unnecessary harm or suffering, nor does it change the fact that the overwhelming majority of human beings do desire a healthy, happy, cooperative, flourishing society, and so on, and as such, have a rational obligation to stop rapists from harming others. And if you can tell people what they should value, then you're admitting that objective value exists. You can tell people what they should value, if they hold other values. And you can even be objectively correct in doing so. What you can't do is tell someone that there exists an objective, unconditional obligation for them to value something, such as a healthy, happy, cooperative, flourishing society, despite whatever circumstances they desire to actualize. Because no such objective, unconditional obligation exists. And again, this is true whether a god exists or not. If you think that a good, sound moral philosophy necessitates that we posit such objective, unconditional obligations, then you've created two problems for yourself. The first is that you'd be wrong. Objective, unconditional obligations to hold certain values are not necessary for a good, sound moral philosophy because they needn't exist in order for a good, sound moral philosophy to do its job. And the second is that such objective, unconditional moral obligations do not exist anyway and cannot be derived from any moral philosophy, including Christianity. And I've seen nothing from you demonstrating otherwise. You can't derive an ought from the is of Christianity any more than you can from the is of atheism. Now let's talk about the Euthyphro dilemma. In your video, you seem to be under the impression that the reason I invoke this dilemma was to show that God cannot be the source of objective values. But that's not true. I don't need the Euthyphro Dilemma to do that for me. The reason I can conclude that God cannot be the source of objective values is the simple fact that the term objective value is self-contradictory and meaningless. There's no such thing, and God cannot be the source of something that isn't real. I bring up the Euthyphro Dilemma for an entirely different reason, namely to show that words like right, wrong, moral, immoral, perfect, and imperfect are necessarily trivial, meaningless terms in a Christian worldview. To review, Here's the dilemma. Is something moral because it's commanded by God, or does God command it because it's moral? If the former is true, then morality becomes arbitrary. And no matter what God commands, it'll be moral by definition, even if it caused, oh, say, 
endless unnecessary suffering. This is a problem because it renders it a meaningless tautology to say that God or God's commands are good. Now on the other hand, if the latter is true, then it means God is appealing to some moral standard external to himself, making him just the messenger rather than the actual source of morality itself. And this, of course, exposes theism as unnecessary for objective morality altogether. Well, the typical apologetic response to this is to say, well, it's neither. Something is good not just because God commands it, but because it reflects God's eternal, unchanging nature. There's a few problems with that. Murder is wrong, right? Well, what is murder and why is it wrong? Murder is intentionally terminating the life of a human being without their consent. And why is intentionally terminating the life of a human being without their consent wrong? Well, as the Christian apologist will tell you, it's wrong because it's inconsistent with God's nature. Uh -oh. So you can't have it both ways. If standards of morality, i.e. what is right and what is wrong, are based on what is consistent with God's nature and what is inconsistent with God's nature, then the intentional termination of the life of a human being must be morally right, since doing so is perfectly consistent with God's nature. You actually define murder in kind of a funny way. So given your unique definition of what murder is, I'm going to say that murder is not always wrong. Killing non-consenting people could be right. For example, Killing non-consenting people can include acts of self-defense and even capital punishment, and it's entirely possible that those events may not be wrong. Is killing for a human for entertainment wrong is a different moral question from asking, is killing a human in self-defense wrong? You can't sweep both of those questions under the same rug with blanket statements like, killing is wrong. If you're going to tell me something is immoral, I need not only an action, but also an intention, like the action of killing humans for the intention of entertainment is wrong. Now, I'm actually inclined to agree with you on this point. In fact, I, I agree wholeheartedly. The definition I used for murder in my example was a very vague, generalized definition that didn't take into consideration obvious exceptions like capital punishment or self-defense. What I want to demonstrate to you now is that my point becomes stronger, not weaker, when we consider intention. Take 2 Kings chapter 2, verse 23 to 24. Elisha is traveling to Bethel when some youngsters show up and poke fun at his bald head. Now, Elisha asks God to do something about this, and so God sends two woodland bears to maul and kill 42 of this town's children. And that's, that's the whole story. Elisha continues on his way. After that, it's never mentioned again. So let's talk about intention. Premise 1. Actions consistent with God's nature are moral, while actions inconsistent with God's nature are immoral. Premise 2. God's actions are always consistent with God's nature. Premise 3. From 1 and 2, God's actions are always moral. Premise 4. God performs the act of terminating the life of a child with the intention of punishing them for making fun of baldness. Conclusion, therefore, from 3 and 4, it is moral to terminate the life of a child with the intention of punishing them for making fun of baldness. So if you object that terminating the life of a child with the intention of punishing them for making fun of baldness is moral when performed by God, but immoral when performed by humans for whatever reason, then it necessarily follows once again that neither God's nature nor God's actions are truly the standard of what is morally right and morally wrong for human beings. If terminating the life of a child with the intention of punishing them for making fun of baldness is not morally wrong because it's against God's nature to do so, and it clearly isn't, then why is it morally wrong? Obviously, the answer lies somewhere other than God's nature, rendering your response to the Euthyphro Dilemma falsified. Now, as it happens, you do try to make the argument that a single act can be moral when performed by God and yet immoral when performed by humans, and you attempt to do this by drawing an analogy between God and a fair-minded judge. Now, as I've already shown, just making this objection falsifies your response to the Euthyphro dilemma. It doesn't matter why a single action can be moral for God to do but immoral for humans to do, so long as the fact remains that a given act can be immoral, yet perfectly consistent with God's nature. Now, just because it, it may be good for a fair-minded judge to imprison people, that doesn't mean it's good for John Doe to lock people he thinks are unjust up in his basement. Bingo. Bingo. This is precisely because what is good for me to do to my fellow civilians is not based on what a judge does to my fellow civilians. You've proven my point perfectly. Thank you. Let's hear what you have to say in response to the other problem with your answer to the Euthyphro Dilemma. The second problem with this response is that saying morals reflect God's nature doesn't actually do anything to answer the question. It only puts the question into different terms. Is God's nature one of honesty, for example, because honesty is right? 
or is honesty right just because that's what God's nature happens to be? Now, the original Euthyphro Dilemma asked if morality was based on God's arbitrary commands, and the answer was no, it's rooted in his essential nature. Now, in your dilemma, num or your new dilemma, number two is the correct choice, except a nature refers to a being's essential properties. So natures don't happen to be, rather they essentially are. This makes for a non-arbitrary and entirely plausible foundation for the existence of objective value. Now before anything else, I wanted to point out to you how poorly this line of argumentation actually serves you. And this may be off topic, but if it were truly the case that natures don't happen to be, rather they essentially are, then you would have to concede that the nature of the universe is essentially what it is and couldn't be otherwise, rendering God an unnecessary hypothesis to explain anything about our cosmos. But I digress. The real problem here is how phenomenally inconsistent you are in the way that you answer this dilemma. Now you say that honesty is right because it's a part of God's essential nature, but I wanted to get a sense from you of what specifically you mean by the phrase essential nature, and so I, I probed you a little bit in the comments section of your video. Here are a few clarifications you made for me. Quote, we know the properties essential to being the standard of objective morality. If a deity is the standard of morality, it must have that same specific set of characteristics, end quote. And then you said, quote, the standard of morality must have a specific set of qualities, honesty, love, etc. If a deity lacks those qualities, it is not the standard of morality, end quote. Now, in light of this, your claim that honesty is right because it's part of God's essential nature is extremely misleading. You're actually saying the opposite of what you appear to be saying here. This nature of love, honesty, etc. is not essential to the God of the Bible. It's essential to whatever the objective standard of morality is, and you believe that the God of the Bible happens to have that nature, thus qualifying him to be the objective standard of morality. But my reframing of the Euthyphro dilemma wasn't about the objective standard of morality. It was about the biblical God. Now, in light of this distinction, I'll rephrase the problem once again. Is the biblical God's nature one of honesty because the objective standard of morality would have to have this quality? Or would the objective standard of morality have to have this quality because it's part of the biblical God's nature? Well, it's become obvious that you flatly deny the latter, and yet, that is how you initially answered the dilemma. In any case, think about what you're saying here. You're saying that because the biblical God has this nature and these qualities, we can use him as the objective standard for morality. But how do you know that the objective standard of morality, whatever it is, must have these qualities and not other qualities? How did you come to this conclusion? How on earth can you possibly know that? Intuition? Observation? Deduction? You can't say that you came to this conclusion because these are the qualities embodied by the biblical God because then you'd be patently guilty of circular reasoning. We know that the biblical God is the standard of morality because he has quality X, but we know that the standard of morality must have quality X because the biblical God has this quality. Round and round you go. So what is the standard that you're using to make the assessment that God must have this quality and not that quality in order to be the standard of morality? What is it about honesty, for example, that makes it a quality that the standard of morality would essentially have to have. And in fact, what matters is not how you answer this question. What matters is that you don't actually take your moral cues from the biblical God. You're taking your moral cues from what you know are the qualities the biblical God has to have in order to be a standard of morality. In other words, it is unnecessary for you to know the biblical God's qualities in order to know what is objectively moral. All you need to know is the set of qualities God would essentially have to have in order to be a standard of morality. And indeed, QB, you already claim to know this set of qualities. So do you need God in order to know that honesty is morally right? No, because you knew that honesty was morally right before you knew that God was honest. If what you're saying is true, the biblical God is not the standard of morality at all. No deity is. The true standard of morality is this specific set of qualities. That's the standard. Even if it were the case that no deity existed which embodied these qualities, you would still have knowledge that these qualities are morally right and their negations are morally wrong. In fact, you claim that this knowledge is self-evident. 
What this means is, even if you subscribe to the existence of objective moral values such as honesty and love, I don't, but you do, these values would not infer the existence of any god. Congratulations, you just defeated the moral argument for the existence of God all by yourself. Put it to you this way, given your take on things, our knowledge that honesty is moral would be a priori knowledge, but our knowledge that the biblical God is the standard of morality would be a posteriori knowledge. How can that be? That doesn't make any sense. How can something known self-evidently have any requirement for a standard? And how can the knowledge of what to use as a standard be gained through observation and experience? You've got everything backwards. You've got it so backwards, it's incoherent. Now I want to address something else you said. God and his essential properties exist out of necessity. Now at first this appears to be a blatant case of question begging, and why would I grant that? If I agreed that the biblical God cannot not exist, I wouldn't be an atheist. You aren't just telling me what your position is, you're telling me that your position is true by definition, and that's a fallacy. The only way to define something into existence is to assign it a definition which matches something we already agree exists, and I certainly don't agree that the biblical God exists, so that gets you nowhere. But then I considered that you meant something much more subtle than this. And so once again, I asked you for clarification. Now, here's what you said, quote, If X has an essential property, lacking that property would cause that object to cease to be considered X. And then you said, essential refers to a fundamental characteristic that gives a thing its particular identity, end quote. In other words, what you mean when you use the word God is a being that has the property of honesty. So any being that does not have this property is simply not what you mean by God. If, if a dishonest supernatural being had created the exact same world you see around you now, you're saying you wouldn't consider this being God because this being isn't what you mean by the word God. And so I guess in this case you would say that God doesn't exist, rendering you an atheist? Is that about right? Because it sounds kind of silly. And it creates a pretty messy situation. If I were to show you uh, a biblical example of God behaving dishonestly, intentionally causing someone to believe something he knows is false. What would be your response to this then? I mean, would you simply assign this all-powerful creator found in the Bible a different term other than God and then continue on with your life? Would you conclude that the Bible is a fallible book that misrepresents God? Or would you amend your definition of God to allow for occasional dishonesty for the greater good or, or, or some other excuse? Well, if it's the latter, then you're flip-flopping again, QB. You'd be amending the standard of moral perfection to fit the biblical God's actions, which is the opposite of what you were just doing before. So for the sake of consistency, I certainly hope that you wouldn't do that, considering how severely it would discredit your entire moral position. But as it happens, I do have an example of the biblical God acting dishonestly. Quote, the coming of the lawless one will be in accordance with the work of Satan displayed in all kinds of counterfeit miracles, signs, and wonders, and in every sort of evil that deceives those who are perishing. They perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. And for this reason, God sends them a powerful delusion so that they believe the lie, and so that all will be condemned to have not believed the truth but have delighted in wickedness. 2 Thessalonians 2, 9-12 so here we have an example of God behaving dishonestly, intentionally causing someone to believe something he knows is false. Further, God is not doing this for their own good, but explicitly for the purpose of ensuring that they are condemned to hell where they will suffer. Now you told me specifically that the Christian God is consistent with being the standard of morality, quote, unless you can show him to have immoral actions plus intentions, end quote. Well, QB, it seems I've done exactly that. Your ball. If human life is objectively valuable, then you should value human life. And if you value human life, you should act in a way that promotes peace and reduces suffering. God's role is to be the source of objective morality. Well, as I already pointed out to you, you don't actually believe that God is the source of objective value, since objective values can be known a priori before even knowing a posteriori that any particular deity embodies them. So don't bullshit a bullshitter now. If you value human life, you should act in a way that promotes peace and reduces suffering. Couldn't agree with you more. 
But at the end of your videos, you encourage your viewers to test all things and hold on to the good. Well, I'm encouraging you to do that now. If it's true that valuing human life obligates one to act in ways that promote peace and reduce suffering, then one of two devastating inferences must be made from this. Either the biblical God values human life and is not acting the way he objectively should, or the biblical God does not value human life. Because the actions of this being hardly promote peace and reduce suffering. And in fact, a thorough reading of the Bible will tell you that more often than not, the actions of this being reduce peace and promote suffering. Test that. As somebody very smart once said that you shall know them by their fruits. But these fruits are rotten, QB. And you know it.